Imam al Hussein showed that he is superior. Imam al Hussein showed that he is victorious through his akhlaq. The victory of Imam al Hussein was symbolized in his sabr. Victory of Imam al Hussein was symbolized through his perseverance. Victory of Imam al Hussein was symbolized through those noble values which he stood up for. Imam al Hussein emerged victorious from the plains of Karbala through his ideology. In that, through his blood and the blood of the companions that was spilt, you find that the ideology of Imam al Hussein is prevalent in every corner of this world. Symbolize the victory of Imam al Hussein such that. Karbala became that single most strongest symbol of resistance towards dhulm until the day of judgment. Karbala became the symbol for nobility. Karbala became the symbol of honor. Karbala became the symbol of haq until the day of judgment. And you find that for Bani Umayya, they were losers in every sense of the aspect. Imam al Hussein went to Karbala and on the day of Ashura, his soul ascended towards the heavens. He left Karbala having achieved everything that he wanted from this sacrifice, from this battlefield. And you find that Bani Umayya did not gain anything that they wanted from that battlefield. If anything, Karbala became the reason for the downfall of the dynasty of Bani Umayya. You find that Imam al Hussein exposed them for who they truly were. The party of the devil disguised within the robes of Islam. Imam al Hussein exposed them in such a manner such that they revealed their true mask in front of the world and any free minded intellectual seeking for the truth when he looks at Bani Umayya, he does nothing but spit on them and invoke eternal damnation for what they did. This could not have been possible through, except through the battle of Karbala. For you find that Imam al Hussein emerged victorious from every dimension conceivable. From the perspective of sabr, akhlaq, from the perspective of nobility, from the perspective of ideology. Today, 1400 years later, you have millions of people who make Karbala their Qibla. And by Qibla, we mean spiritual Qibla. That revolution of inspiration and motivation. Imam al Hussein captured the hearts of the people, generation after generation. They are willing to suffer persecution in order to uphold. The memory of Imam al Hussein. Who is this Hussein? Captured the hearts of the people. Look at Karbala now. Ziara Arbainiya. 20, 30 million people abandoned their families, abandoned their work, sacrificed their wealth. They are ready to face death in the eye. Out of love for Imam al Hussein. Who is this Hussein? For you find that the Imam emerged victorious from every possible dimension conceivable, including the military perspective of Karbala. Imam al Hussein emerged victorious even from a military perspective. Ya yeah, subhanallah. You find that this is something extremely baffling. How does a group of 72 men 
majority of whom are in their elderly ages, the likes of Habib ibn Madahir, Muslim ibn Ausaja, Joan, elderly in their age. How is it that a group of 72 companions went into war against a large army of people? Now it comes to understanding, before we move forward, the number of the army that was within the ranks of Umar ibn Sa'ad al-La'in. We have a number of traditions in regards to the numbers that are there. The first tradition you find from Imam al-Mujtaba and Imam al-Sajjad salawatullahi wa salamuhu alayhima Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad where Imam al-Sajjad says that la yawm ka yawm al Hussein. there is no day like the day of my father Hussein. aqad izdalafa alayhi thalathuna alf there is no day like the day of Hussein. Indeed, he was surrounded or he was attacked by a group of 30,000 people. وَهُمْ يَزْعَمُونَ أَنَّهُمْ مِنْ أُمَّةِ جَدِّ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ Thinking that they are from the Ummah of Rasulullah. يَتَكَرَّبُونَ إِلَى اللَّهِ بِقَتْلِهِ Seeking proximity towards Allah by shedding the blood of Imam al Hussein. Look at the ideological deviancy of this group. That they went to Karbala to fight Imam al Hussein, to kill Imam al Hussein, thinking that by shedding the blood of the grandson of Rasulullah, they are seeking proximity towards Allah. Qurbatan Allah. And you find this mentality of Bani Umayyah alive and present even today. You look at all these beasts who are the party of the devil, even in this day and age responsible and guilty of killing the Shia. Do they not say that they are killing the Shia in order to gain proximity towards Allah? al qawm Abna al qawm Yazid may have died as a person, but the mentality of Bani Umayyah is present even today. For you find that the first figure in regards to the army, 30,000 people, Imam al-Sajjad says, and the same thing that Imam al-Mujtaba says, 30,000 people, but then you find you have scholars like Alam al-Ardabili rahmatullah alayhi in his book Hada'ika to Shia where he states that the army that came to fight Imam al Hussein swelled to the number of 100,000. We are of the opinion that both numbers are correct. The figure stated by Imam al-Zayn al-Abidin is correct, 30,000. And what Alama al-Dabili also narrates, 100,000, is also correct. Because the number 30,000 that Imam al-Sajjad is indicating towards is that initial contingency or that army that was at the forefront and directly responsible for shedding the blood of Imam al-Hussein. The remaining 70,000 acted as a reinforcement for the 30 and the reinforcement for the other reinforcement. Therefore, if you were to take the number of the entire army, including those who were directly responsible for being in combat and the other part of the army that was there but not directly responsible, in terms that there were a reinforcement, the entire bigger picture comes up to 100,000 and there is no tabayun between or contradiction between these two figures each one points out towards a certain perspective of the army for you find hundred thousand people have come to wage war against imam al hussein why did ibn ziyad al la'in send a hundred thousand people for what reason these are 72 people why such a big number the first reason People like Ibn Ziyad had stooped to such a level they could not be considered as human beings anymore. He wanted to wage a war and shed the blood of the grandson of Rasulullah in a manner so beastly, in a manner so gruesome that the world has never seen. He wanted to make an example of Imam al Hussein such that nobody would ever think twice about standing up in resistance against Bani Umayyah. The gruesomeness on the other hand 
illustrates the level and the intensity of the hatred that they had in their hearts for the family and the progeny of Rasulullah. This is one. And on the other hand, you find this is where a group of people who are jabban, cowards at the most literal sense of the meaning. They knew the caliber of these 72 men. Each and every one of them is a battalion on its own. And they could not risk, they had this fear of standing in front of these 72 men because they had already known of the bravery of the likes of the people within the army of Imam al Hussein. These were people who would be terrified upon the contemplation of coming face to face on a battlefield with the likes of Abu Fadl al Abbas. These are people who were filled with fear, cowards. Which is why when you read the Maktal, you will find that not a single companion of Imam al Hussein and not a single youth from the youth of Bani Hashim was killed in fair combat. Not even one. Abadan la. Look at all the knights of the Masaib that we have recited. Zuhair ibn al Qain attacked from the back, a spear or a uh, a spear was launched inside his back. Look at Shah Qasim. He was struck with a sword from the back of his head while he was tying the lace of his slipper and standing up. Attack from the back. Cowardly attacks. Look at Abis. When they attacked him, they threw stones at him from every direction. These were men who had absolutely no sense of courage. Had not a single ounce of nobility inside them. Before you find not a single companion of Imam al Hussein was overcome in fair combat. Acts of cowardice where they ganged up on them. For the army of Ibn Ziyad was fully aware of the heroics and the courage of the men standing together with Imam al Hussein, including Imam al Hussein. For they come in their numbers of a hundred thousand in their total. Those directly involved in combat and the reinforcements. We go with the number of Imam al-Sajjad, the people who were there for direct conflict in the direct line of combat. How is it that a group of 72 men are able to protect themselves and prolong the war on the day of Ashura from the time of Fajr until the time of Asr? Give or take, if you estimate the time between Fajr and Asr, give or take, takriban 10 hours. Here and there. How is it? This is unseen in the history of warfare. That a group of 72 men are able to fight and defend themselves against a force of 30,000 for more than 10 hours. A military operation which truthfully should have ended within an hour or two? What secret did the army of the Imam possess such that this war lasted for over 10 hours? From here you see two things. Number one, as we pointed towards the caliber of the men standing with Imam al Hussein. This was courage and honor that came from where? Not necessarily physical courage. These were people, when they went to do their jihad, were hungry and thirsty for three days under the scorching sun. The answer is their spiritual power. The determination that came as a result of their deep love and Iman and Yaqeen. This is why you find that there is always a lot of importance stressed on building our love for Ahlul Bayt. Because when you are overcome with love, you are able to surpass all the limitations of your body. And you find that this love 
is not an infatuation. This love is a result of the Iman. Your alliance with Ahlul Bayt is a direct representation of your deep belief in Tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which we have been trying to establish over the last few days. Ati'ullah wa ati'ur rasul wa ulil amri min kum. You cannot separate Tawheed from obedience towards Ahlul Bayt. And you find that the Quran warrants this. Yani ajeeb, sometimes you find people come out forward with ishkal. How is it that Ali Unil Akbar killed 200 people? How is it that Abu Fadl al Abbas killed 500 people? How is it that this companion killed 80? That companion killed 300, 400? They come and they say, no, la, these are exaggerations of the battle of Karbala. Sure, ya yeah, exaggeration. This is a promise and this is a covenant that is given to us within the Quran. Look at Surah Al Anfal. We're answering the ishkal where people say, how is it that the likes of Aliyun Akbar could kill 200 people? How is it possible one person who is hungry and thirsty for three days killed? And then they come and they do tohma. And they accuse these muballighin and ulama who narrate accounts like this. Look at what is written in Suratul Anfal. Suratul Anfal. This ayah is revealed when the Rasulullah is in a state of war. And just to make it clear, when we say Rasulullah is in a state of war, defensive war, Rasulullah, not a single war in his life, he initiated violence. In fact, they were the recipients of violence the entire time. War is an emergency measure that is used for self-defense. And with all the 80 battles that took place over the 13 years when Rasulullah, or for the time that Rasulullah was in, Mac in Medina, from the 80 wars slash battles that took place, the total number of casualties on both sides did not exceed 1,000. Go and read Islamic history. It shows you that even in a state of war, where you are the one being oppressed, and you were in a form of self-defense, even at that time, Islam's main focus is minimize the casualty, because violence is not justified in Islam. In any case, this verse of the Quran is revealed. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Ya ayyuha al-Nabi, harrith al-Mu'minina ala al-Kital. Ya Rasulullah, motivate your people, motivate the Mu'mineen. Do not be intimidated by the large numbers that you are surrounded with. Why? Iyakun minkum ishroon, sabirun, yaglibu mi'atayn. Allahu Akbar. Allah is telling Rasulullah that tell you the mu'mineen not to worry, not to be intimidated, not to be overcome with fear. Indeed, 20 mu'mineen, 20 believers who have sabr in them. Sabr over here means that they have tawakkul on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because they have tawakkul, they have sabr. 20 people who have sabr and have tawakkul on Allah. Allah is telling us in the Quran that Allah will give the power of 20 pious mu'mineen who have sabred. He will give them enough power to overcome 200 people. This is for a regular mu'min who has sabr. Then what about the likes of the companions of Imam al Hussein, who Imam himself says there is no companions who before you and after you who are as loyal as you. They are at the highest level of sabr. For to discount and to mock narrations like these is equivalent to mocking the prophecies and the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran. Do not be surprised when you hear in the Bakhtal, Ali al Akbar killed 200 people or Abu al-Fadil killed 800 people, more or less. La. These are people who possessed within them spiritual power Amir al muminin when he was asked, how did you lift the door of Khaybar? That 80 other people could not even be able to move or lift. Was it from the power of your body? Amir al muminin says it wasn't a power that was jismani. It wasn't a power that was physical. This was a power that was spiritual. For you find that, coming back to our kalam, 72 men, 
holding back an army of 30,000 people for more than 10 hours or just around 10 hours when what would normally be expected is that the battle finishes in less than an hour or two. The fact that the army of Imam was able to keep them apart and stretch the battle for 10 hours, number one, shows you the caliber of the men. And number two, it shows you the expertise and the skill and the wisdom that Imam al Hussein had when it came to warfare. Military tactic. The fact that the war lasted for 10 hours or so shows you the greatness of the commander of that army. At the end of the day, Imam al Hussein is the son of Haider al Karrar, military chief and advisor and consultant of Rasulullah. For therefore, tonight, inshallah, for the time that we have, we shall try to discuss certain aspects of the battlefield and some of those strategic military decisions from a military perspective that Imam al Hussein conducted and implemented as a result of which we are able to deduce his superiority even from a military perspective over Bani Umayyah. All this with a loud salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. For every battle and every war that takes place, you find that tactic and strategy is of utmost importance. And the Imam being a ma'asum Imam, perfect in every field, including the art of war. The narrations mention that from the first tactics of the Imam in regards to the military structure and the war, is that when Imam al Hussein reached Karbala on the 2nd of Muharram, before the Imam settled the camps and the tents, the Imam conducted a survey of the entire land of Karbala. In that he saw that the land of Karbala, where they are, there is the river Furat crossing by these plains. Wherever the river crosses through the plains, that means the immediate surrounding areas next to the river is land which is fertile. Which is why you read that the river Furat, around it, there were a number of palm trees. This is the route that Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas took back from the Furat to go to the Mukhayyam, to the Khaymaga. Which is why Zayd al Rukad al La'in and Hakim ibn Tufail al La'in, how did they strike the arms of Abu al Fadl al Abbas? They were hiding behind a palm tree. So we understand that the immediate land which is surrounding the river or around the river, and generally speaking, land which is close to rivers, is land which is fertile. These were lands that had palm trees in them. It would not be logical and it would not be strategically wise to set camp over there in the midst of all these palm trees gives the enemy an opportunity to hide and ambush them and attack them so there was this one side of karbala the area of the forat with palm trees and then in addition to this there was a wide open desert space there was a wide plain covered with sand and this was surrounded by plateaus or small hills Plateau in Arabic is known as Til, small hill, which is why you have Til Zainabiyah. On a day like tomorrow, Yawm al Ashura, when Imam al Hussein went into the Maidan and was surrounded by the enemies, Sayyida Zainab runs out of the Khaymaga and she stands on that Til to overlook into the Maidan where she witnesses the final moments of Imam al Hussein. For therefore you find that in addition to the fertile land with palm trees, there was an open desert area. This desert area was then surrounded by plateaus. Which is when, why? When Imam al Hussein surveyed the land, he decided to pitch the tents close to the plateaus. Which is why you find even today the position of the Khaymaga is east of the Til Zainabiya. Why? Imam al Hussein pitched the tents around the plateaus, and on the other hand, there was the river. In this way, Imam al Hussein was able to define the parameters of the battlefield and restricted it to that desert plains between the plateaus and the river. Straight away, you find the first military tactic of Imam al Hussein is that he defined the parameters of the Maidan. Number one. 
Number two, on the night of Ashura, nights like this, Imam al Hussein commanded all his loyal companions to get together and to dig a khandak, to dig a trench in the shape of an ark to protect the tents from behind them. And this is why on the day of Ashura, as they dug the trench, they chopped down trees in the forms or pieces of wood to make firewood. They threw the firewood into the khandak. And on the day of Ashura after Fajr, Imam al Hussein lit the khandak on fire. Why did the Imam do this? The Imam digs a trench from the back, number one, to protect the women during the time of battle. Because you are facing against an army that has absolutely no honor, an army that has absolutely no values, no etiquette, no morality. And the first thing they would do is that the first opportunity given to them, they would attack the women, which is the biggest sign of a coward. For they dig a trench and they light it on fire to protect the camp from behind them. Not only the lighting of the fire or the digging of the khandak acted as a defense or protection for the women, but through this strategy, Imam al Hussein forced the enemy to attack him from a single direction. They were not able to attack Imam al Hussein from every direction. When you are 72 people and you have to defend yourselves from every direction, it becomes easy for you to get disintegrated and then to be overcome. Therefore, Imam al Hussein saw it is of utmost importance that if we are going to sustain ourselves in this battle, we need to be united in a single front and face the enemy from a single direction. Over here, there is a big lesson that is to be taken outside the art of military or outside the art of warfare. <coughs> Imam al Hussein emphasized on the unity of these 72 men. So long as you are united, so long as you are one, so long as you are not separated amongst each other, you constitute to be a great force amongst you that can attack and keep away a hundred thousand people. This is a lesson for us. When it comes to building unity amongst ourselves, Shia of Ahlul Bayt. Ya Subhanallah. We try to put forward our hands to outsiders and build bridges with outsiders which is important and in its place definitely without a doubt but we do that and at the same time we are burning down our own house and fighting in house and breaking relationship with other Shia we cannot tolerate each other bear enmity with each other and then try to go and build bridges outside you cannot repair somebody else's house when your own house is on fire. Unity amongst ourselves. Shia of Ahlul Bayt. Unity and love between each and every person who carries inside his heart the love and the wilaya of Muhammad and Ali Muhammad. Muhammad wa Muhammad Muhammad In any case, Imam al Hussein digs the khandak and lights it on fire in order to force the enemy in combat from a single direction. Ahibai, now sit back and think. So far, you have an army of 72 people against an army of 30,000 people. And up to this point, Imam al Hussein has dictated and imposed upon the enemy the parameter of the battlefield and has even imposed upon them the direction of attack. Subhanallah. Which war in history have you seen where the minority is the one that dictates 
the parameter of the battlefield and the direction of the war in the battlefield. You don't find this anywhere except in Karbala. And you will only find it in Karbala because you have a military leader such as Sayyid al-Shuhada Aba Abdullah al Hussein. For you find the first strategy surveying the land. Number two, Imam al Hussein dug the trench and lit it on fire on the day of Ashura. Number three, the actual tactics and the strategies that were implemented on the day of Ashura. Day like tomorrow, Yom Adim La Yom Kayomika Ya Aba Abdullah. Have to be very careful on how you approach tomorrow, how you spend tonight. This is the day where the entire cone weeps for Imam al Hussein. The Malaika are doing Aza for Imam al Hussein. The animals are doing Aza for Imam al Hussein. The jinn are doing Aza for Imam al Hussein. Let us be very careful of our attitude on a night like this. Ziyanat Ashura. We condemn those people who expressed their happiness and their joy on the day when Imam al Hussein was killed. Let us be absolutely clear on what our attitude, our sentiments, and how we deal with each other, and how we speak with each other on a night like this. Let us not be from amongst those who are laughing and expressing joy, when on a night like this, the daughters of Rasulullah, such as Zainab al-Kubra, were weeping and wailing. Even for this split moment, do not be with the character of Bani Umayyah on a night like this. This is a night of grief. It's not a night of games or jokes or laughter. Abadan la. This one night, this one day is an exception to the entire year. And it's supposed to be an exception in the conduct, the manner in which we behave and speak with each other. For be careful of the night which you are in and the day in which you are. Not that we are claiming to be Shia of Hussein. And we are laughing and filled with joy on a day where Rasulullah is weeping for Imam al Hussein. Allah call in the day of Ashura, time of Salatul Fajr comes in. Imam al Hussein leads Salatul Fajr with this group of 72 companions. As soon as the Salat is finished, you find that Imam al Hussein arranges his army in a, in, a, in a certain format. He divides this army of 72. What is mashhur is that there were 32 horsemen and 40 foot soldiers. Even from the 72, not each and every one of them had a horse to ride on. Subhanallah. They were a minority. But they were not intimidated. And this is another practical lesson for you and me. In your daily life, you could be a minority because of your ideology. Do not be intimidated by it. If there is any lesson that we can take from Karbala, this is the lesson to take home. Not to be intimidated, not to compromise your deen and your aqidah because you're a minority. La. In any case, Imam al Hussein gathers these 72 men, 32 horsemen. 40 foot soldiers, he arranges them in three ranks in a format. He makes a right wing, a left wing, and a center flank. The commander of the right wing is Zuhair ibn al Qain. The commander of the left wing is Habib ibn Madahir. And then you have the center flank with 17 Bani Hashim and the flag bearer and the commander in chief of the entire army, Abu al Fadl al Abbas ibn Murtada. Imam al Hussein arranges his army in these three ranks and then he goes forward and he delivers a khutbah inviting the people towards Islam. Even at this point, Imam al Hussein is emphasizing on a manner of solving this dispute in a non violent manner. Subhanallah. He goes, he delivers a khutbah. No result. Zuhair ibn al Qain goes to deliver a khutbah, no result. Burair goes to deliver a khutbah, no result. Finally, Imam al Hussein delivers a second khutbah, no result. Imam performs two miracles, one of which we talked about. Two mu'jizas the Imam performs to wake these people from their ghafla. 
Sawaun alayhim a'anzartahum am lam tudhirhum la yu'minun. They had fallen to the depths of deviation. There is no hope. Until in the end, Umar ibn Sa'ad al-La'een comes in the middle of the Maidan. And he takes out an arrow, he puts it in his bow, and he says, O oh people, O oh army of Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad, bear witness for me in front of Ibn Ziyad and in front of Yazid that I was the first one to shoot the arrow on the camp of Imam al Hussein. The narration mentions he shot the arrow, and this arrow went and pierced the tents of the women. The women start wailing, the children start wailing, and at this time, the end entire army showered arrows on the camp of Imam al Hussein. They protected themselves with their shields. At this point, Imam al Hussein said to them, Now Allah has given you permission to defend yourselves in war against them. For the narration mentions that as soon as the war began, it was within the tradition of the Arab warfare. That as a battle begins, the first, the first people in the battle will never be a general combat. First, the two most revered, experienced, brave warriors will come out on a one-to-one -one duel. And so the narration mentions that Ibn Sa'ad sent two people by the name of Yasser, the slave of Zaid ibn Abi Sufyan, and Salim, the slave of Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad. They came out as the initial swordsmen who were supposed to represent the courage and the strength of the army of Omar ibn Sa'ad. They come out and they challenge the companions of Imam al Hussein to a duel with the sword. Imam al Hussein sees both of them. He tells one of his companions to stand up by the name of Abu Wahab. First, Habib ibn Madahir. And Muslim ibn Awsa just stood up and were ready to accept the challenge. Imam al Hussein says to Habib, No, sit down. We shall send Abu Wahab. Abu Wahab was a companion who was extraordinarily tall with broad shoulders. And he had this aura within him that he would create sort of fear within the army. This is the initial duel of the battle, the beginning duel of the challenge. The results of such a duel are absolutely important on the outcome and the morale of the rest of the army. For the narration mentions Abu Wahab comes out. He accepts the challenge from Yasser and from Salim. This one single companion of Imam al Hussein, Abu Wahab, was able to gain victory over both Yasser and Salim, sending them to Jahannam wa bi'sal masir. And this is how the Battle of Karbala begins. The army of Umar ibn Sa'ad says, this is one person, Abu Wahab, who we have never even heard about, whose heroics are not even counted in the books. A one soldier who is unknown from the army of Imam al Hussein comes and kills single-handedly two of our most courageous, well-known swordsmen. This has a great impact on the morale of the army of Umar ibn Sa'ad because now they begin to panic. They have seen two mu'jizas. One unknown person has killed two of their most revered, most experienced swordsmen. And over here you see Umar ibn Sa'ad gives a command in order for the morale of the army not to break. He sends a command for the right wing of his army under the command of Amr ibn Hajjaj al-La'een to attack the right wing of Imam al Hussein. And therefore you find after this one-on-one -on -one duel, the right wing of the army of Umar ibn Sa'ad al-La'een attacks the right wing of the army of Imam al Hussein. Zuhair ibn al-Qayn is in charge of the right wing. The narrations mention that as thousands of horsemen came rushing towards the right wing of Imam al Hussein, Zuhair ibn al-Qayn arranged his men in two orders. In the first order, he put the soldiers who were 
were on foot using spears. They bent down on one knee. They formed a formation like a wall. They bent down on one knee. They firmly planted their spears into the ground at a 45 degree angle. Such that as the horses ran, they ran into the spears and got hamstrung. They were not able to move forward. And so they retreated. And as they were retreating, the second group of men who were standing behind the men with the spears were the archers shooting arrows at them, forcing them to retreat. For subhanallah, you have men on horse because they're being pierced by the spears. And on top of that, they are being showered with arrows. So when they retreat, they are trampling on their own men. Which is why when they retreat, they see that there are hundreds of their men who have been killed within this initial attack. Subhanallah. Where in history have you seen that a group of 72 men defend their fort successfully against an army of 30,000? Not only were they successful in defending their fort, but they adapted a strategy which was offensive and made the other army retreat. Where have you seen this in history? 72 men force 30,000 people to retreat. La yawm ka yawmika ya Aba Abdullah. These are not normal men. These are the men of God who are fighting under Hussein ibn Ali. Who are holding the alam of haq. So the narration mentions that Amr ibn Hajjaj is forced to retreat. When he sees the number of people killed in his side. Out of anger. And in order to take vengeance. They attack the right wing again. For a second time. At tabari in his tariq says. Faktatalu fatadarabu waktatalu sa'atan. Or a second time they attack the right wing of Imam al Hussein under the leadership of Zuhair ibn al Qayn. The fighting goes on for an entire hour. The camp of Imam al Hussein is able to maintain their fort, and the army of Umar ibn Sa'ad is forced to retreat for a second time. Look at the military expertise of Imam al Hussein. Not only did he define the battleground for them, not only did he impose the direction of war, not only did he defend his fort but forced them to retreat, he changed the strategy from that of defense to offensive. Read any history in the world. Read every battle that has taken place since human history has started to begin to be authored. You will not find a battle as spectacular as the Battle of Karbala. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. For the narration mentions that the right wing has lost hope and are in despair. They have inf been inflicted with a number of injuries. And they are seen to be incapable of attacking and breaking the right wing. So at this time Omar ibn Sa'ad changes strategy. In the second attack on the right wing, it was during the second attack that Muslim ibn Awsaja became shaheed. From the companions, majority of those historians who have focused on the analysis of the battle as a battle, they will tell you that Muslim ibn Awsaja was the first companion of Imam al Hussein to be killed in the second attack on the right wing. Up till then, all the men were intact. When the right wing or the attack on the right wing has failed, you find that Omar ibn Sa'ad changes tactics and he commands Shimr bin Dil Joshan al Lain, who was in charge of the left wing of his army, to attack the left wing of Imam al Hussein. Keeping in mind that the armies are face to face, when the left wing attacks the left wing of another, they are going across diagonally in the battlefield. And this was used as a tactic to terrorize and to create fear on the side that you are attacking because they are riding against you or riding towards you with all their horses in all their might, with all their slogans and weapons. For the army or the contingency, the left wing of Shimar bin Dil Joshan al-Lain attacks the wing of 
left wing of Imam al Hussein, subhanallah, the left wing is under the commander or under the leadership of Habib ibn Madahir. The narration mentions again that they tried to attack again and again, but at the end of the day, Habib ibn Madahir and his men were so firm that they forced Shimmer to retreat. Three times this army has been made to retreat. What are the ratios? One to four hundred. Seventy-two men against three thirty thousand. Give or take one to four hundred. But the army of Haq makes the army of Batil retreat three times. These are lessons for us to contemplate on. In tasahibul Haq inside of you. This is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you. And then the narration mentions that when the army of Omar ibn Sa'ad saw that these systematic attacks are not proving to be efficient and they are getting more and more, they are being inflicted with more and more injuries, this is when Omar ibn Sa'ad said to his army, attack all of them together from every direction. Which is when, when they attacked them from every direction against the arch, this is what in the maktal, which is generally narrated as hamlatil ula, when there was a collective attack from them on every direction, this is when 50 companions of Imam al Hussein became shaheed. And what we understand is that this was close to the time of Zawal. And then the Salat happened, and as you know, the rest of the maktal, but when these remaining companions were there with Imam al Hussein, they were forced or they engaged on one-to-one -one duels. They went to fight out one-on-one, -on -one, sometimes in twos, sometimes in threes. And this is how the battle lasted till the time of Asar. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Tonight is the night of Aliyun al-Akbar. Masaib Aliyun al-Akbar. The narration mentions that <coughs> The narrations mention that on the day of Ashura, as the time of Zawan had finished and the time of Dhuhr had been completed, none of the companions of Imam al Hussein were alive. Each and every one of them had become Shaheed. There was no more Habib, no more Muslim, no more John, no more Abis. And some of the historians mention that as only the Bani Hashim were remaining, each and every one of them competed from Imam al Hussein to get permission to go into the Maidan. Some of the historians are of the opinion that the first youth from Bani Hashim to go into the battle field was Ali Yunil Akbar. Allah Allah. The narration mentions when Ali Yunil Akbar came to his father, Imam al Hussein, to seek permission from him. Imam al Hussein looked at him and tears began to flow down his cheeks. Imam al Hussein hugged Ali al Akbar. Both of them began to cry until they fell down. Ali al Akbar asked for permission to go into the Maidan. The narration mentions the Imam looked at him. He kissed him on the forehead. Allah, Imam al Hussein is kissing Ali al Akbar on the forehead. Usually the son kisses the father on the forehead. The narration mentions that Imam al Hussein kissed Ali al Akbar on the forehead. Head. He helped him to wear his armor. He tied for him an amama just like the way he tied for Qasim. And then he bid Ali Yunil Akbar farewell. Once Ali Yunil Akbar, he helped him mount onto the horse. When Ali Yunil Akbar went into the Maidan, Imam Al Hussein began to weep and he began to cry. He raised his hands up in dua and he said, Allahumma ishhad ala haula il qawm kad baraza ilayhim gula. Ya Allah, bear witness against this community that this young man, Ali Yunil Akbar, who has come to fight in front of them, he is the one who represents Rasulullah and looks similar to Rasulullah in terms of his speech, in terms of his look, in terms of his actions. Ya'ani Ali Yunil Akbar shabi Rasulullah. He looked just like like Rasulullah, his features, his way of talking, his way of walking. It is as if it was not Ali al Akbar who is going to the Maidan. It is as if Rasulullah himself is going into the Maidan. Imam al Hussein then said, Ya Allah, whenever we wanted to do the ziyara of Rasulullah, whenever we want to look at Rasulullah, we would look at the face of Ali al Akbar. And then he recited the verse of the Quran while his eyes were, while he was crying, and he 
tears were rolling down his cheeks. He said, "Inna Allah hastafa Adam wa Nuhan wa ala Ibrahim wa ala Imran ala alamin." And then he shouted out to Omar bin Saad. He said, "Yamda Saad, kata Allah rahimak kama katal ta rahmi." He said, "O oh, Omar bin Saad, may Allah destroy your lineage the way you were killing my lineage." The narration mentions as Ali bin Al Akbar went into the battlefield riding his horse. He challenged the enemies reciting a poem. He would say, "Ana Ali ibn Al Hussein ibn Ali, wa nahnu wa Baytullah awla bin Nabi." He would say, "Ana Ali ibn Al Hussein ibn Ali, nahnu wa Baytullah awla bin Nabi." Tallahi la yahkumu fina ibn al-da'i Adribkum bis sayfi uhami an abi Dharba gulamin hashimiyun karashi Aliyun al-Akbar said I am Ali the son of Hussein the son of Ali Indeed we are the ones who are closest to Rasul Allah Wallah the illegitimate children shall never rule over us I shall strike you with my sword and defeat defend you against my father i will strike you the strike with the strength of a youth who is harsh me the narration mentions that ali ibn al akbar did a jihad where he kept attacking the right wing and dismantling them sending them to the left the people didn't know is this ali ibn al akbar or is this haider al karrar from barzakh the narration mentions imam al hussein was standing by the door of the khaima he was watching the jihad of ali Ali al Akbar. He had killed 120 men. At every time Ali al Akbar would gain victory, Imam al Hussein would smile from the door of the tent. Sayyida Layla, the mother of Ali al Akbar, was looking at the face of Imam al Hussein. So long as Imam al Hussein is smiling, she knows that her son is safe. Allah, Allah. Until an enemy by the name of Bakr ibn Ghanim came to attack Ali al Akbar from the side. Suddenly, when Imam al Hussein saw Bakr, his complexion changed. Imam al Hussein's face was filled with grief. Layla asks Imam al Hussein, Oh Imam, is my son in any sort of trouble? Did he get harmed? At this point, at this point, Ahibai, Imam al Hussein turned towards Sayyida Layla, mother of Ali al Akbar. She says to Layla, she says to Sayyida Layla, that I know that the duas of a mother are mustajab. Ali al Akbar is faced with a very, uh, with a very dangerous person from in front of him. I want you to go into the tent and do dua for your son, for indeed the duas of a mother are mustajab. The narration mentions Sayyida Layla went into the khaimah. She sat on the floor. She raised her hands towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and she did dua. Which is this dua? Allah, Allah, Sayyida Layla raised her hands and she said, Ilahi, Ya Radha, Ya Usufa, Ilal, Ya Akub, Ya Radha, Ibrahim, Ilal, Hajar, Ya Allah, the one who sent back Yusuf to Ya Akub, O oh Allah, you the one who sent back Ibrahim to Hajar. Look at the dua of Sayyida Sayyida Layla, look at the pain in the words of Sayyida Layla. She says, Ilahi bi ghurbatil Hussein. <laughs> she says, Ya Allah, I am asking you by the loneliness of Imam al Hussein. She says, Ilahi bi atashil Hussein. Ya Allah, by the sake of the thirst of Imam al Hussein. She says, Ilahi bi sabril Hussein. Hussein, <laughs> Ya Allah, by the summer of Imam Al Hussein, Rudda Alayhi Waladi Ali Saliman. She says, Ya Allah, return my son Ali back to me. Over here in the Khaimah, Sayyida Layla finishes her dua, and over there, Ali Yunil Akbar gains victory over the enemy. No one is willing to come in front of Imam Al Ali Yunil Akbar. So the narration mentions Ali Yunil Akbar returned back towards the Khaimah covered in wounds. A part of his armor was damaged. He comes back to the Chaima and he says, Oh my father, the scorching sun, the heat outside and the weight of this armor has made the thirst unbearable. Oh father. Imam al looks at Ali al and says to him, My dear son, it is only a little 
little while until way before your grandfather will give you and quench your thirst from the cup of Kawthar. He gives sabr to Aliyud al-Akbar and then he tells to Aliyud al-Akbar go back to the tents and give or bid farewell to your mother Sayyida Layla for a last time. Allahu Akbar. The narration mentions Aliyud al-Akbar went into the Khaimaga. He finds Sayyida Layla is sitting on the tent and she is crying. As soon as she saw Aliyud al-Akbar she stood up. She hugged him and she started crying. Look at the conversation between mother and son. Aliyud al-Akbar is seeing his mother is crying. He puts his hands on the shoulder of his mother and says oh mother why do you cry? She says how can I not cry when you are facing death? Aliyud al-Akbar tells Sayyida Layla oh mother do you not wish tomorrow on the day of judgment that you stand in front of Fatima Zahra and you tell her that I sacrificed my son for your son. As soon as Sayyida Layla heard this she stopped crying. Aliyun al-Akbar bid farewell to Sayyida Layla, to Sayyida Zainab, to Sayyida Sukaina, all the women in the tent. Imam Aliyun al-Akbar then came out of the Khaimaga. He bid his father farewell for a last time. At that narration, Allah, Allah, Ya Shia, Aliyun al-Akbar turns to Imam al Hussein and he says, Abata, Usi kabi ammi khaira. He says, Oh my father, uh, my last advice, my last wasiya to you is that you take care of my mother Layla. <laughs> Allah, Allah, Ali al Akbar went into the battlefield for one last time. He rode his horse and he went inside and he attacked them. For in Kalabat Mai Manata Hommai Sarah, Wa Mai Sarata Hommai Mana, he attacked them, dispatching the right wing and the left wing. At this point, one person from the enemy by the name of Murra ibn Munkid, he looked at Ali al Akbar and he said, By Allah, may the sins of all the Arabs fall upon on me if I do not kill this boy. The narration mentions Murrah came and he approached Ali Yunil Akbar from the side while he was protecting and fighting from the front. He came. The narration mentions Fata'anahu birru mahfi dhahri. He came and he pierced Ali Yunil Akbar with a spear from his back. Allah, Allah. The spear became stuck inside the body of Ali Yunil Akbar. At this point the narration mentions فَذَرَبَهُ بِسَيْفِهِ عَلَىٰ رَأْسِهِ وَعَلِيَا وَمُسِيبَتَا The narration mentions he struck Ali and Al-Akbar with a sword on his head. He struck Ali ibn al-Akbar with a sword on his head. The blood is pouring down the head of Ali ibn al-Akbar. So he held on to the neck of the horse such that he does not fall over. As the, he held on to the neck of the horse, the blood from the head of Ali ibn al-Akbar began to fall on the face of the horse. It covered the eyes of the horse. Allah, Allah, the horse cannot see where it is running. So it ran into the direction of the enemies. Everybody took a turn to him. Hit Ali Yunil Akbar. This one hits him with a sword. This one hits him with a spear. The narration mentions Fakatahu Irban Irba. They cut him to pieces until he fell down from the horse. He said, Alaika minis salam. Ya Aba Abdullah. Oh my father, these are my final salams. Sayyida Ruh Sayyida Sukaina says that when my father heard the cry of Ali al Akbar, it was as if his ruh was going to come out of his body. Imam al Hussein went running towards Ali al Akbar. He came towards the Maqam Ali al Akbar. Ahibai, Majlis Tamam, Masaib is almost more completed. The narration mentions these are the final moments of Ali al Akbar. Narration mentions Imam al Hussein came running. He sat by the side of Ali al Akbar. He put the head of Ali al Akbar on his lap. Allah, Allah. He wiped the blood and then he wiped the sand from the face of Ali Yudil Akbar. And then Imam Al Hussein put his cheek on the cheek of Ali Yudil Akbar. He heard Ali Yudil Akbar is whispering something. What is he whispering? Ali Yudil Akbar says to Imam Al Hussein, Oh my father, I see Rasul Allah. I see Fatima Zahra and Khadija. They have all come to take me to Jannah. 
Oh my father, he is my grandfather Ali Yunil Murtada. He has come with a cup from the pond of Kawthar. He is saying to me, tell your father Al Ajal, Al Ajal. As soon as Ali Yunil Akbar said this, he went quiet. Allah, Allah, Ya Ibrahim, you are not able to see the sacrifice of your son Ismail, but come to Karbala. This is Hussein. His son Ali is cut to pieces in front of him. Matame Hussein.